Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Finance and Facilities Committee meeting uh, here in the Lindholm building. Uh, we'll start off general business. Verification meeting properly posted? Uh, yes, it has been. Opportunity for citizens to speak. I see no citizens, so we're going to assume there's nobody here to speak. Uh, action items, approval of minutes from the December meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Do I have a second? I second. Motion by Mr. Caffrey, second by Mrs. Voigt. Ms. Voigt. Uh, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Approval of vouchers. All right, we have a couple of voucher questions this month. Um, you all Thank you, that. people, for voucher questions. <laughs> That's not um, what Sherry was saying earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind the questions. It's the Monday questions that are difficult. Two, two minutes per question, Sherry. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Voucher number 325551 for student question was, what is the component for homeless student? And um, by law, we have to transport homeless students. And I put in here all the definition of what con um, constitutes homeless. But basically, the students in our district that are homeless, we transport to their um, district of origin, and we split that cost with um, the district of origin. We have a route bus for first student that goes to Milwaukee and the areas that are within there, West Dallas, New Berlin, those, that's currently serving 35 students. That's what this $33,000 is for. And then we also contract with Go Kid Go for some of the outliers, like we have a student in West Bend and that we have to transport to those schools. So we have about 18 of those students going through Go Kid Go, which is a different service. Okay, 30 minutes for rebuttal. I get two minutes, I get right. 30. <laughs> no, 30 seconds for development. Any questions? Yeah, any questions? I do have a question. Yeah. Um, what was the um, time period for this 33? Um, that we paid in December, so it should have been the November bill. That's one they, month then? That's one month. One yeah. month, okay. Whether it's October or November, I'm not positive because they were behind on their billings. Yeah, no, that's fine. Just but it was for know. a one month period. Okay, one month. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Moving on to the next voucher, 325712 Avid Center. Um, question was, is this, this was paid for an Avid membership and is that an annual fee per school or based on student involvement? It is an annual fee per site. This particular bill happens to be for West High School, but over the course of the, the year, we've paid several at different schools. They just come up at different times. I don't know why but they, each school gets billed in individually. One for North was just submitted recently, so. Questions on that? Is that say $3,899 per school? Um, it's different, it appears to be different if it's elementary versus high school versus middle school. It's mm -hmm. enrollment driven, I think, but I'm not sure. No, oh, that would make sense too. Yeah. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me, voucher 325780. Table to University of Wisconsin for WeCan services. WeCan um, says, how do we pay for the WeCan service? WeCan is where we post all of our uh, job openings and it is an annual fee. This is our fee for this year and it's based on enrollment. So we get charged based on the number of students that we have enrolled. Questions? Okay, voucher 325870, Building Solutions LLC. Um, and it said $20,256. The, the way the report went, it looked like it was just for the referendum, pre-referendum work, but it was actually for pre-referendum, um, North Kitchen and the district's master planning. And it's um, a third party vendor that's used, that we use as an owner's representative to work with our architects to make sure that everything that is being done is all legit and what we're looking for, someone who can speak that language. Any questions on that one? I have a question. Yep. Do they sign off when the project's done then? Do they carry any sort of liability insurance in case they overlook something? I'm gonna refer that question to Yeah, Barry. they cover um, liability. They also sign off on any pay applications okay. or anything that, uh, that go through. And along with that voucher came the question and uh, have we done analysis on how many web hits we had on our, I'm assuming that was for the referendum page, <coughs> and we had 3,500 hits since September 1st on the referendum page. And that's just to access the page itself. There were more hits going around and looking at the information within. 
It's just the entry page. Mm -hmm. Correct. So on this um, owner's rep, I know, Darren, there's been a, you did some costing on that and had mm -hmm. some competitive bids for yep. the, we did our for the for longer term, term. So maybe you want to put that in the packet for the board. If, if they, did we, did you put in the packet already for the board to see? Uh, comparisons. I mean, the little bidder was chosen. I don't know if we, um, no, I, I sent it to all the vendors that, um, but I'll send it out in the Friday update or something. Yeah, you just have a little summary sheet there. Yep. That, yeah. So yep. Yeah, we've bid out, in terms of that, we've bid out every th part of our team. Construction manager and architect, yep. financial advisor, owner's rep, and probably we have one more to go. That's the investment services for the, from the proceeds of the bonds when they're issued, but that'll be going out in the next week or so. That, uh, that um, important to note that, you know, we're going about a process where we're monitoring mm -hmm. things and... Yeah, absolutely. Competitive bidding. And, <coughs> absolutely. You know, I try and get some confidence that we're not, you know, I'll that we're being frugal in our actions. I right? will put that on my to-do list here. Okay. There's extra uh, additional questions on the back side. I was trying to be frugal with paper. So the next question is on voucher 325679, payable to National Lewis University for um, tuition for Darcy Lamers. Um, this is for, it's called teacher leading training for the recovery, reading recovery program. And we select certain teachers that go through this program. They get um, credits and they become leaders in our district to come back and teach other teachers reading recovery and to work with the students on the re reading recovery program. There were actually two teachers sent, Barbara Sanchez also, but that was on a separate voucher. To, to this year or to within the last month? Do you know how many we send? Uh, I, there were two this last month. I, when I look back on the payments, I don't recall seeing anyone else sent this year, but I can come up with that information and provide it in for Darren in a Friday update. Do you know how long the strategy has been in place? By reading recovery, it's been as long as I've been here. I know we've done work with reading recovery, but I don't know how, how far back it goes. Okay. I can certainly find those things. Five. This is my fifth year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the goal is that these teachers come back and then help train other teachers too within the for the lead people that dedicate quite a bit of time to it. And this is right. the tuition right. charge for that. No to find out. Not debating the importance, just wanted to understand oh, a little bit better. I didn't take it that way. <laughs> and, he, and, and this this is for one person. So they sent two people, but there was an additional charge for that other person. So, Or they didn't send, excuse me, two teachers participated in the training program. And that's the tuition per person. Questions? <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is not good tonight. Um, Voucher 325865, uh, expense reimbursement for Laura Anderson. And the question was, what is IB training? And that is International Baccalaureate Training. And that's a program, a curriculum program that Catholic Memorial High School is implementing. And as part of our Title II funding, which is teacher and principal training, a portion of what we get is given to the private schools based on their enrollment. This is how that private school is choosing to spend their teacher training, sending their principal to this training um, to be able to come back and implement this program at their site. It is totally their discretion on how much they want to, how much, where they want to spend their money as long as it's within the boundaries of the grant. But we manage the money and we pay the, because we get the money, the funds based on the enrollment of the private school and our schools. Yeah, um, I was aware of monies uh, that we need to uh, pay towards uh, transportation for private schools and some other scenarios where we have uh, arrangements, where we've made arrangements with some of our private schools, um, where we have uh, agreements already made. Is there, um, I don't know if there is a, a quick way to 
uh, maybe summarize other charges that we might be receiving monies from the state and, and or federal government and then distributing back out to our private school? Um, I mean, from a grant the perspective, I can easily do that because we have to claim based on public or private schools. So we do keep that data. So I can tell you for Title I how much, Title II. Um, I don't remember if there's any Title III money that goes to the public. But I I would have to do a little research, maybe talk with TNL to see what other funds we're paying to. You know, I know there's transportation, like sure. you said. Those are the only ones that I'm aware of off of the top of my head are the federal grants where we get the money and the transportation requirements. Um, but I, I can certainly do a little digging and make sure that I, it's, there's not money going out that I'm not aware of. It's it's not uh, a high priority or a rush. It's more just something to have a basic understanding of to kind of give us some perspective. Um, and then if there's if we want more details at a later time, we can drill down if we have more questions. So Okay. Quick question, sure. is this, I'm sorry. No, you're good, I, you go right ahead. You're welcome. <coughs> um, is this new that we do the, is this a new thing or has this it's, always been the way it was done? It's, um, it's not new, but for Title II, it's new that it gets split out to a different expense code. In the past, we just put all of Title II to one expense code, we weren't required to break it apart by public and private. Unlike Title I, we've always had to break it apart by public or private. Now, um, I believe it started last year that we had to start reporting on the public and pri public versus private expenses. But the money has always been driven based off the private school enrollment and our enrollment. And we've always dedicated a portion of the funds based on the enrollment to, pu um, to public schools, private schools, excuse me. We also provide services for some of the um, private school kids, like speech and language and Correct. stuff like that as well. So they will come to the sites mm -hmm. yes. and receive services from us as well. And I should be harder to track, I'm sure, monetarily. It might be a little more difficult, but I think we can get a count on numbers it of least. students at least. Mm -hmm. It might be harder to put a price tag on those because they're utilizing our existing teachers and is it costing and I want to say it's only the school the the children that go to the private schools from this district right correct you have to live in the district that is right? correct yeah yeah if they're going to a private school in the, in the district, district yes. but they're coming out of the district let's say they live in New Berlin but they're going to Catholic Memorial we wouldn't provide those no, services they have to they have to pay taxes where they get yeah, the services. New Berlin would have to pay right. for those services Yep. Other questions on that? Okay, down to the last question. P card, P card voucher 20180469 US Bank, which were payments to first student. Um, and asks what events were these P card expenses for and why did we use the P card for these? We're trying to have, um, we're making a effort to try to use the P card more for accounts payable in our department for any larger charges because we get a rebate. And so fiscally it's a, a good thing to do. We're very conscientious in working with the vendors though. Anybody who's gonna charge us a surcharge to use the P card, we obviously don't do that. It's only the ones. Now first student with the contract routes that we have, they will not accept the P card. But for extra trips, extracurricular, which is the case of these two, the first one in question was for all the team sporting buses for a month. So that was the, um, 14,000 and so that they were willing to take a P card on and the other one for the 10,000 were environmental ed field trips um, as part of the curriculum the sites send buses of kids over to EB shirts for environmental ed field trips and then EB shirts pays that bill and then charges back the schools okay. and that's a, considered a separate field trip even though it's part of the curriculum Tacoma. yeah I was I was surprised to see first student on there just because I thought large contract they're just gonna be getting these big checks right but it makes sense and if whatever we can push to the card um, I think that makes sense as we get the rebate so 
Yep, we have a dedicated AP card just for these types of things so we okay. can track based on that card how much we're putting through on our e AP sure. side in addition. And it's all just to try to increase our rebates. We're getting monthly rebates now that we switch to US Bank versus the annual or might be quarterly. I need to double check that. Um, but versus a one time once a year rebate. So pretty nice. And are, are there other vendors, other of our larger vendors that we're encouraging to use that? Well, Aramark, we take, we do. Um, they're not happy about it, and I suspect when we get our next RFP, they will put that in there that they will not take hmm. that. We included in the last RFP, and I don't know if they noticed it. So we're taking advantage of it, and <laughs> we charge it. Just, it is what it is. Um, sure. So part of that is negotiating the contract, but you know, there's the trade-off. Are they gonna just charge us a bigger percentage on our contract than when we can afford to cut a check? So we're really trying to be very conscientious about who we're using and the amount of time it takes to check with the vendor. So we're trying to hit the big, the, the big hitters that aren't gonna charge us money, and then we're keeping a, um, a database of who accepts them and who doesn't. The, the other big vendor we, I know we use is Apple, and they don't charge a right. fee, and we were leasing a few years ago, and we moved away from that, and the P card was part of that yep. that process um, of that transition. So, okay, thank you. Unless well, there's any questions, that is it for the voucher questions. Motions. I move approval of the vouchers as presented. Second. Second from okay. Karen. <laughs> More, motion from Mr. McCaffrey. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Five zero. Information items, monthly budget items. Okay, so we have our monthly budget update and nothing alarming that's jumping out. Everything is pretty much on target. In December for our revenues, our, our building rentals were really our main local source of, of funding, um, but we're really close in line to the percentage of revenues collected for local sources. Inter-district sources were really just our first round of e-achieve billing payments that we're receiving. Um, state sources, we got our bilingual bicultural payment in, in December. Um, we didn't have any federal payments in December, nothing overall in other that was to speak of. Um, but overall, we're at 15.39% compared to 14.77% in the prior year. We're expecting our tax payments coming up in January, which is always a good time for us. <laughs> it's the month where we watch our budget very closely, um, our spending, I should say, very closely. Um, from an expense perspective, as always, salaries and benefits are the highest. Um, really coming in very close. Benefits are coming in a little bit lower than we would have expected, so we need to analyze to, as we go into this next budget cycle why we're the Benefits a little bit seem to be a little bit over budgeted, so we need to do a little analysis on that. <coughs> um, purchase services, main expense was our pupil transportation. Um, it looks very large, but it's because we did have two billing cycles. They were behind on their payments. We paid two months in December for that service. Um, non capital objects. Uh, we're where we expect to be, uh, less than last year, but we had more money budgeted in the capital objects than non-capital this year, so that one's running a little bit higher for capital objects. No debt retirement in December, insurance and judgments, minimal activity. Um, so overall, we're at 32.25% of our spending on our budget, which is really right in there as where we were at last year this time, at 32.29%, so we're exactly where we expect to be right now. For Fund 27, um, we had uh, mainly our categorical aid and our Medicaid aid payment, our cl Medicaid claim payment, were our only sources of revenue, and then salaries and benefits are really the main source of spending in Fund 27 through the, through the whole year, pretty much. Questions on the budget, but overall things are good. We're not expecting any bad surprises. Is tracking. Okay, Mr. Como. It's from a cash flow perspective. Um, we predicted that we would be fine throughout this year without um, yep, hitting up the line of credit or anything. So November and January are our 
our two nail biter months. Yes. And November was absolutely not a problem. And January, we will not have a problem. We're close, but it's right where we expected it to be. Okay. So we were um, fine. That's this, good news. The start on the 15th is. Yep. Good. And we have enough, you know, for the payroll on the 15th, even without the taxes. We don't cut it that close. So. All the employees are happy That's when right. you say that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> A question on, on on our cash balance that we you know used to have to borrow money. Mm -hmm. How much of a pool of water do we have left at the at the bottom point, roughly? For our January our cash flow, yeah. we will have after the the payroll about two million dollars, which is very low. But it's it's a lot. That's not, after right. that's after the January fifteenth payroll and. We should be getting the taxes on January 15th, so, but we don't rely on that. You know, there's always times where they forget to transfer or something, so we never rely on having to have that payroll covered by, but we're very close. Well, that's less than two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. Not like we have a huge surplus of cash no. when we're not borrowing. No, we you just I, have enough. Exactly. And I do talk to our AP person to say, if you get any very large bills right now, let me know before you pay them, <laughs> just, just to make sure. But I can always hold them two weeks. Like central office, you know. Those. Any other questions? Okay. Any anything else? On the, okay. That's my report. That's great. Budget forecast, 2019, 2020. Um, each year in January and February, um, uh, the administration is tasked with providing you a multi-year budget forecast. And really, um, this year is gonna be, every other year is a little more difficult because it's the next state biennial budget. And now with leadership in Madison being split, um, there's probably a little more uncertainty than there was uh, maybe before. So, um, but to project out in this environment, you know, we really need to, um, have some informal agreements on the assumptions to be used in the forecast, right? The forecasts are only as good as, as the assumptions end up being. So, um, you know, I, I, as we projected last year, I think next year we're in for some budget difficulty. Uh, this year I've attached our budget development calendar for 1920 that we use as a general guide. I'm not gonna say we follow it exactly, but it's usually um, pretty close. Um, so in um, the summer, um, end of summer, mid to end of summer, you'll get a preliminary budget. September, we'll have the budget hearing again, and then I, then we come back in late October to um, complete everything. Everything's um, certified at that point um, from the state, and then you guys um, approve the final levy and the, the budget's in place. The The next page is, again, these are the broad, broad brush kind of assumptions. There's a lot of um, more uh, intricate ones that we do, but I thought I'd just walk you through um, these to give you a general idea of what um, we're looking at. Um, in terms of resident enrollment, um, we've got uh, a projection of down 100 uh, students from the current year. Um, per, per, per pupil aid or revenue limit authority, both of them are a per pupil <coughs> funding. So we are assuming we'll get some increase in funding uh, in the formulas. I, I didn't get into whether it comes in aid or revenue limit authority because at this point, in the process we're really, or can we pay our bills or not, regardless of the funding um, scenario. Um, is it possible we get no funding increase? It, it's possible, um, but I, I think that's unlikely. Um, so we're putting $100 per pupil in there. Last year we got 200 and some odd dollars um, funding increase, um, but the politics and everything were a little different last year um, leading into the elections, et cetera. Uh, open enrollment, um, both in and out. I don't. I assume that the level of open enrollment is going to remain where it is this year. I have no way of knowing whether open enrollment is going to go up or down. Um, the best data we have is the most recent year, um, and it's you know overall open enrollment continues to be a positive um, for the school district of Waukesha. Uh, but I don't get into trying to predict um, those numbers. Employee compensation. Um, if you recall, teacher cost, you know, CPI, the consumer price index is a key variable in that. That along with interest rates and everything else <laughs> is climbing. Um, it, it might, um, again, this is all um, up to the, the board. 
Um, the impact of that increase in our ability to pay wages is up to you as a board. Um, um, but it is much lower. In the last past few years, it was always so low. It really, not that it wasn't a non-issue, but it wasn't a significant uh, issue. I forget the low was 0.12% <laughs> or something, um, you know, very small in, in terms of our overall budget. Um, but that is um, starting to shift, so we'll have to spend um, a little more conversation um, related to that as we get um, talking about the 19 uh, and 2019-20 um, employee compensation package. Health insurance, I actually had a, a conference call with our um, consultants today. Um, some years in self-funding, you run hot. Some years you have great claims. We're having a little rougher year. Um, the projection right now, and it's early, um, our, our plan year is September 1 through August 31st, so we're only, we have what, four months of solid data of claims. Um, but we're looking at a 10 to 12% increase in rates. Um, if we do nothing. And how we've approached this in the past is um, the district, in our budget assumptions, we, we say, you know, we're going to take on 5 or 6% of the increase, but the other 5 or 6 to get down to that is going to have to come through plan design change, employee contributions, or, you know, there's four or five main kind of categories of tools you can use. Um, otherwise, you know, the district can choose to go higher or lower. Um, but the, the offset is balancing your budget through another cost center. So um, so that'd be the process on health insurance. We are starting those to look at options um, of what we can do with health insurance. Um, Chris Hedstrom and I will be leading a, a staff insurance committee again um, to look at options and alternatives if we feel um, some are going to be needed. I have a question on that. It, in here it says being self-funded, actual claims will play a large role. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what else goes into that? For an increase of 10 to 12 percent, like I mean, are you anticipating uh, <coughs> increase in um, bills? Like the cost of a doctor is going to go up, or what else? Yeah, you know, um, that, okay. the biggest part obviously is um, claims. You are what your claims are, right? Yes. Um, so they we use about a, a 30 month averaging of what our claims okay. are, um, but each year health insurance agencies or networks have inflationary factors within their contracts so there's things okay. that we have no real right in, you know we're riding on okay. you know along with those um, contract agreements um, we have had some high cost claims so our stop loss carrier that cost continues okay. to to go up as well so those would be the two other okay um, primary issues that would drive that and then and there's a company that manages our claims too um, UHC is the network we okay. we rent. Yes. Um, and then they process our claims. Is that are we expecting that to increase? The administrative fee, I believe, is on a percentage. The percentage isn't oh, they, okay. changing, but okay. The multiplier might the denominator or the uh, might right might be multiplying by a larger number, okay. um, but it's not set to claim increase as a as a measure of the percent. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of things that play into it because sure. I think a lot of people think that because we're self insured that it's just rides on claims but that's untrue now we do all the same things that a fully insured um, plan would offer we just rent it out and buy right. services here and there okay. to make up for it thank you um, then there's some smaller um, line items uh, three percent for dental and utilities tuition that's mainly special ed tuition that's tied to someone's wages somewhere else so there's an inflationary factor um, with that, as I mentioned before, open enrollment out, we're going to assume status quo for now. And then tax levy and rate, at some point we will be rolling those out, but again right now we're just, are we, can we pay our bills or not? And um, that question, um, like I said, I think we need to do a little work on that, so. Is it January when we get, when we learn about CPI and what that's going to be? I think it's fairly early in the process. It's January it? or February, yeah. We'll know it shortly. Okay. I can't remember the exact date, but and it's coming in, I want to say two and a half. We'll have it. That, that's a pretty big, that's an important number as mm -hmm. it that drives, um, you know, salaries and pay, payroll. So um, negotiations, it's a negotiations point. And mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is we had requested the health insurance report. Um, when will we be seeing that? 
depending on how long our February agenda gets, it'll be February or March. Um, we can certainly do it in February, but we've got several other things kind of log jamming in February, but um, okay. we're ready to, um, that was one of the things we talked about on the conference call today with our consultant was, it's a broad topic, what do we want to present, what are the things we should focus on, um, but I'm shooting for February. Okay. Right. There's only so many things you can fit into a one hour meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, that is yes. very true. Yeah. Hot last meeting, fit into that one hour. We haven't had a one hour meeting in a long time. This will be the first. Let's, let's, let's go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> so again, I, I think the most important thing for the committee to know. It's my birthday. We're going to have a one-hour meeting. And for oh, anyone uh, watching at home, there giving all presents. There is a process to our budget development. There is, you know, we. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's pretty refined. Um, so we'll follow that, and then if if things start changing in Madison, we're going to hear a thousand rumors between now and. The other difference, I think, from previous or the last handful of biennial budgets, we might not get that biennial budget until September or if we go back to the way, you know, sp split leadership was before, it doesn't often lead to quick decision making or approvals. So, so that's all we have on the, the budget document. So we'll come back with a, a more formal forecast uh, next month. I think we'll be pleasantly surprised. This, uh, this might be completely different than we've ever experienced before. It, it could be. It could be because of the nature of there's kind of an understanding of who can do what and who can't do what in yeah, this particular. Yeah, the roles might be clearer. Yeah, the roles are quite a bit clearer on this. I mean, yeah. it's, it's going to be interesting. I hold my breath. Well, you should always be optimistic. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's all we had on the budget uh, forecast. Okay, moving on to discussion items. We don't have anything to discuss tonight. <laughs> oh, good. That's all good. Other business uh, items, recommendations for future meetings? Um, nothing? No. Uh, Mr. Gray sent us a thing, or maybe Mr. Clark sent us on the evaluation he achieved by the marketing, Mueller Communications. I still think it, I'd like to know when we do an assessment, there's a couple things I'd like to know when we do enrollment projections, and that's part of it. We achieve is apparently there's an enrollment issue there in terms of how many people enroll in um, internet type public or schools. Um, I also want to know if per household, maybe a statistic we should look at as a district is what's the children trend per household of enrollment? So we have an X number of households in Waukesha, that should be a census thing. And we should know what our enrollment of children are and see how that's trended year to year. There will come a point where we should start to bottom out on declining enrollment when we can compare ourselves to maybe Skeagol or New Berlin or you know some comparable type school districts in the area. Because there's the average of children per household should start to be normalized across the communities, I would think. There has to be a bottom out point. Mm -hmm. There always has been. No, I would agree yeah. with that. Yeah. And we are yeah. set. Um, we had an enrollment and demographic study done about three years. Well, I usually do it every three years because we can do it more often, but really the data doesn't shift that much. So we're due to go through that process again in the next you know, six to nine months. So, um, I mean, it should, you know, we also have the factors of, you know, voucher schools, but I think that's going to be probably constrained. I mean, I don't think they'll decrease it, but. I don't think it'll yeah. continue to grow. Or is the market doesn't. mature? You know, have you hit that level right. of that participation? It's just going to kind of be there. Um, intent is to put a cap on that. You know, where's that? So. Okay. Uh, we have a few contract uh, legal issues tonight, one or two anyway. So, do I have a motion for adjourning to executive session? Or do we have? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. I was just waiting for a motion. <laughs> okay. I made the motion. I move to adjourn to executive session pursuant to Wisconsin Statutes 1985, parent 1, parent E, for delivering or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session.
Do I have a second? <laughs> Ms. Voigt seconds. This is a roll call vote. Mr. McCaffrey? Aye. Ms. Reinchuk? Aye. Ms. Voigt? Aye. Mr. O'Brien? Aye. Mr. Como? Aye. Okay, we'll go.